So I'd really like to welcome Akaila, who will be chairing this session with us today. Um, and um, as we are a little bit just on sort of on time, but starting, I think it would be good to sort of get going. Um, and welcome everybody who's joining us. There's lots of familiar names with the artist Luke, Malgazetta, Carly, I can see on my list, uh, Mimi, um, some great, and some of our trustees as well are here. So really exciting. Um, for the artists, um, obviously you can keep your um, microphones off and not be on camera um, but obviously you can be visible as well if you have any questions pop them in the chat and my colleague Hugh who's going to be waving now um, we'll ask them for you if you wish or obviously if you want to ask them yourselves please feel free we're going to have a the little opportunities after each session to um, to ask questions we're going to have a little comfort break after we've heard from Caroline John and Pieta who are from Jaqua Arts in Mombasa just to get some off some screen time have a little comfort break but obviously time for questions at the end um, so um, it's going to be hopefully really informal enjoyable you know, informative um, session um, as we hear from various um, important um, partners of ours from literally around the globe. So welcome everybody. Um, Michaela, would you like to say a little bit about your, who you are and what you do? Um, yeah, of course. Hello everybody. Uh, so my name is Michaela Butter and I'm director of Attenborough Arts Centre. Uh, which is a multidisciplinary art centre with a focus on access and inclusion uh, and social justice. Um, so we have uh, we do a lot of work with disabled artists um, and promoting kind of concepts around social justice. Um, my background, um, I have had an extensive career in the arts over 40 years. Um, during that time, uh, I worked with uh, IFA, which was the European, European Forum, Forum for Arts and Heritage, um, looking at how we could promote the concept of arts and cultural policy uh, within wider environmental um, strategies. Uh, I also um, brokered relationships for artists to work internationally. The UK has been traditionally quite island bound and unfortunately seems to be returning that way now. Um, but the opportunity was there to work with BCJEM, which was great to see that you're here today um, and take uh, UK artists over uh, to take part in that. Um, and also brokered an opportunity to work with Sweden and a big network of opportunities around the seas and different parts of Europe, um, including Skegness in England. Um, and again, it was an opportunity to really foster the idea of international exchange. Um, so I'm really in, in, in very sort of privileged to feel that I'm here today. I'm really looking forward to hearing the speakers and to actually getting my head back into international thinking after what has felt like 18 months of, of, uh, of just being stuck at home in a COVID environment um, with Brexit falling around us. Um, so it's just great to be able to have these conversations again, albeit virtually, sadly. So thank you. Thank you, Michaela. I appreciate that. Um, and um, just for everybody who has also joined us, if you didn't hear, this meeting is being recorded as well. So um, just FYI on that. OK, so it was with very, very deep pleasure that I am going to welcome Wonhi Nam, um, Unsel and uh, Mi Park, who are uh, representatives from the Art Lab N3 in Seoul in South Korea. So welcome you all. Um, for the artists and those who don't know, we've worked quite extensively with South Korea, with Seoul, with Wonhee Nam, with Unsul in various different guises um, since 2016. So it's yeah, been five it. years, um, which we're super excited about and we're looking forward to doing more essentially. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna hand over to you guys to chat a bit more about who you are, what you do, what's kind of happening in South Korea right now and well right yeah, yeah thank you very much Michelle uh, hello everyone my name is Wonhee Nam and the founder of Art Lab and Cube in Korea 
and a good friend and a good partner of UKNA. It is really glad, glad to meet you guys in COVID-19 period uh, through the Zoom meeting. And especially thanks for UKNA and Michelle Bowen to invite us this wonderful meeting. Well, first, I would like to introduce our company, Art Lab and Cube. We are based on Korean art market system, but we are trying to make some differences compared to other galleries or organizations. We are trying to make a new art commercial system for the artists and for the um, art dealers and the collectors. Uh, we are support supporting new artists like UKNA and also we are training and producing art dealers to promote the artists to the collectors. Uh, for the collectors, we have some education program of understanding of the global art market and the artists. Well, nowadays, we are facing a new period in art market, especially in Korea. I think this would be uh, my opinion for the uh, first and second question. Well, I saw lots of uh, young artists in Korea fail their work during the COVID-19 period. But I think it is so weird because the market has been bigger and bigger in past few years, even in the COVID-19 period. Well, I never seen this growth rate uh, before in Korean art market. There are some reasons I found uh, for these situations, such as uh, quantitative easing starting from the US and also in Korea. And the people get needs for safety set to prepare maybe another financial matters in the future. So when new collectors who want to buy an art come to the market and find something to invest, it must be the artist who is over the blue chip level. So therefore, uh, for the young or new artists, it is very hard to sell their art and continue their art artist's life. And only few artists survive from this period. And especially in Korea, uh, the Fridge Art Fair, which is from uh, London, will be launched next year so that the collectors will see the real high-end artist artwork from the global galleries, which are already have their own safety market in the US and in the UK and China and Japan or in Korea, which means the native gallery and the artist in Korea needs to search for another way to survive. Uh, in Art Lab and Q, we are trying to uh, the art dealers to get prepared to this wave and also the artist. When I found this, this business, I considered about the system first. Uh, the general market, I think, uh, these three things, which is producer and sellers and the customers. It is exactly the same in the uh, art market, artists and art dealers and the collectors. We are going to be okay with the blue chip or uh, master level artists for now, but how about the next? Uh, we are trying to blow new air to the burning fire. If not so, it will be off soon, really soon. So we are trying, we are training the art dealers to sell the artworks to the collectors. We are selling the guaranteed artists first. Yes, so we can introduce our new artists next. We are not just selling the artworks or promote the artworks, but also we are selling our trust to the collector. And I believe the trust trust of collectors will guide the collector's interest to the next new artist. Then how we promote the new artist or young artist? A question is appearing from my mind. So we are doing international uh, project with UKNA and also other, other groups. We are continuing to develop and support our project to introduce the new artists to the people who want to uh, buy or interest to the, to the market. And also in Korea, we will never stop supporting the new artists in many ways, such as uh, exhibition or auctioning or projects. So I expected our relationship in this yeah, wonderful meeting will be more solid and expanded to blow new air to art market and to the collectors or to the art dealers, to the artists, especially. 
So I would like to introduce two artists, Mi Park and Dosni. But unfortunately, as I said, uh, one of our artists, Dosni, is not with us today. So Unso Nam will uh, introduce the artist. Yeah, uh, hello again, I'm Seoul, and uh, I'm here for uh, introduce our artist Dozni uh, instead of him. Um, uh, before I start the introduction, so I want to share his work uh, with you guys. So, um, did you want to share your screen, Unso? Yep. Yeah, I've given, you should be able to do that, I think. Okay. Uh, Wait a second. second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're not used Just to give me a moment. this. <laughs> While Unsol is, um, I know Zoom is probably not the mechanism which you normally use. So I kind of understand it's all trying to find out where all these, half these things are. Um, but you should have a button on the bottom, which, oh, there we go. Oh, there okay. we go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no, this is his work. Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, as I said, his name is Dasni. Uh, he working as a, a street artist or mural artist. So he usually uh, used this exit sign uh, for his work. So, which means his protest uh, against the like uh, di uh, discrimination or oppression between us or in the world. So in does this work, a uh, shadow uh, with two heads person is coming out from the exit or exit door, um, this person could be artist himself, or I think uh, could be anonymous who has no gender, no race, no age, etc. So it implies artist hope for equality, like a gender equality or any other like equality in the world uh, or possibility, uh, which like, a human being um, can be just themselves as a like a person as themselves, not be like distinguished by race, gender, or etc. So we would like to introduce Tazni uh, for the like uh, upcoming exhibition or upcoming like uh, another event because we think uh, Dazni's work could be like a um, could be like a great like a showcase for um, like a, our a goal to like a world art market. So we want to share the like Korean po Korean young artists possibilities or uh, their potential in the like world market. So he uh, they also have like a diversity. And they also want to show their like a uh, um, goal to equality or show like uh, their like a uh, um, uh, how can I say like a uh, show their work or like a uh, uh, work and their message to the world uh, about like uh, any other equality or any other like uh, value about uh, their thinking so. Yes, um, that was like a simple uh, introduction of Dasni. And uh, please share with me if you have any further like a uh, question about him or any other thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, me Park, the, yeah, could you please introduce yourself and your artwork? Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Mi Park. I'm a performance artist based in Seoul, um, and it's I don't know. I find I find it very challenging to basically summarize what I do because um, I do make very autobiographical works, which normally takes in I guess takes form in different ways. But I guess the common 
um, subject area is that because it's autobiographical, it talks a lot about um, the discriminations I've experienced or any other positive things that I've experienced as, you know, taking part in the wider society in 2021. Um, and because I make such personal works, it was important for me to sort of reach out to the macro politics in order to, I guess, appeal is not the best world word, but appeal to, I guess, wider audience if I can, and I guess make people empathize with the messages that I'm trying to uh, bring across. And because I do make personal works, uh, my, it's, a very, it's very important for me to find um, alternative archiving methods of my performances, because I guess I've witnessed a lot of um, art washing happening in, I guess, in London and everywhere else when I was studying there. Um, and when, I guess, when site-specific works sort of are in the forefront of basically demolishing communities, I've tried to um, redefine what site means in site-specificity. Um, and I guess I've sort of like been researching on how I can redefine that into identities of the artists. So site-specific art would be identity-specific art and sort of treating um, one's body as a site. And a visual, direct visual representation of my works would be basically violating my own identity and appropriating who I am. <clears throat> um, so I've sort of created self-documenting works um, and now I'm doing an ongoing series on how, um, ongoing series to sort of make an encyclopedia of um, animals and plants and everything else that's, that can, I guess, um, best represents who I am at this moment. So I created this squid character with the latex inflatable headpiece <clears throat> in um, like early 2020, because I was in Oxford back then and that's when COVID happened and I just basically got yelled at a lot. <laughs> um, so, so I tried to make this character um, an alien squid that sort of got um, very fascinated by these man-made borders, which is very uncommon in the ocean um, and sort of goes around like legitimizing those social parasites on our um, dry land. Um, so I've been working on developing that character for uh, about two years now um, and I'm trying to sort of expand on that and use this I guess characters as a documentation method so um, sorry I'm losing track of what I'm saying um, but, I, but I hope I'm making sense and uh, yeah that's that's about it. That was wonderful thank you and um, thank I you. just asked Unstall to share your web link um, so everybody can just have a, have a look at um, what you do and I've always I've had the privilege of that because they sent some information through but uh, right um, and I yeah it was amazing it was so <laughs> I think with both of the artists that you shared today for me it feels like quite a shift in um, how young Korean or new Korean artists are, are presenting themselves in their work um, you know it was whilst there was some excellent work previously and it was challenging this seems to be another step forward another pushing of that of those barriers particularly working in a much more performative and um, public spaces um you know was was something i hadn't seen in the time that we've worked together so i don't know if you want to reference that or talk to that as a um a change maybe in the way that artists are responding to the challenges, the work, the country, the global nightmare, you know. Um. Yep. Me so basically you, we're, you? yeah, basically we're trying to find new uh, artists to promote to the global art market and then to the global, uh, yeah, some art system. So yeah, we're trying to, we're going to try our best to support and to promote uh, those uh, artists to the Korean market and to the global market. So thank you very much. 
Me, how do you feel about um, the way that new Korean artists are kind of working um, in perhaps more challenging ways? Um, I've just shared um, Me's link with everybody so you can have a look at her work. Um, and and, and Lunce has just shared the file with me as well. But do you think there's a sort of shift with Korean artists at the moment? They're being more adventurous, maybe a bit more pushing of the boundaries and there possibly has been in the past? Yeah, definitely. I do feel that people are making way more uncensored work. Um, I think that that comes based naturally because Korea is, I guess, being more liberal as a country, whereas before it was extremely conservative, especially in the art world. And considering how art education is in Korea, well, I didn't get an art education in Korea, but based on like my friends who have, I've been told um, it's still extremely traditional. So people are, so I guess nowadays, the millennials are being more, um, I guess, um how do you call it i guess they feel the need to make people sort of ponder on their own anxieties and their own like i don't know the state of the country itself um by sort of reaching out to that frame of um, what sells and how do i mm. sort of attach myself to this professor and please this person in order to sort of survive in the art world um, and it's amazing to see that shift and it's amazing to be part of it, obviously, because mm. um, my work, I don't think would have been uh, very welcomed in the country if it was, no. I don't know, five years ago. Or, no, no. Um, I agree. I think this is <laughs> I love it. kind of like, wow, you know, this is, yeah, this has gone through quite a shift. Michaela. Um, there's two questions, really. One was, to what extent do you think lockdown made a difference in the sense that that people were in their homes, able to just kind of, in a way, almost free from, from that kind of commerciality because they couldn't really go anywhere. And therefore you've been able to kind of think about new ways of, of, of representing your work. That was my first question. Uh, and the oh. second one, um, <laughs> it's just around, um, I'm really fascinated to hear, when you talk about the Korean art market system, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I don't know enough about it. And I've just kind of wondered, in terms of you talked about arts education, what role do universities or colleges play in supporting that transition from university out into the real world? Is, are there any schemes or, or is it just you're throwing out and then you have to rely on, on another kind of network? Uh, so for the first question, well, yeah. I think, well, because of the COVID-19 period, COVID-19 virus. So people isolated in the in their own home, right? Yeah. So they got more interested on the especially furniture and then arts. Yes. So they want to buy more and more. And as I said uh, when I pitched, uh, because of the QE, especially in Korea, also they have they got a lot of uh, flow, money flow. So they need to uh, find another something safe asset to invest, but it can be a gold or it can be a dollar or a pound, something like that. But uh, one of them is, I think it is art, but the art, which is guaranteed in global art market. Yeah. So I think the expansion is quite uh, incredible in Korean art market. So for the second question, I'm sorry. Well, what was the... <laughs> the question was around uh, to what extent do the universities and art colleges help to support transition from oh, being oh. at those colleges out into the real world or or is it or do they not well actually we're not uh, connected uh, in Korean university yet but um, some of our professors help us to uh, training the art dealers and the, the, the collectors. Well, it, it is more like a luxury class in Korea yet, but we are trying to expand to the normal people. Like I'm not saying, right? But well, to the, like to the people, yeah. Okay, thank you. We just have a couple of minutes. We're just sort of on time. Does, <coughs> is there any last points that you would like to make uh, before we take any questions? 
um, no, I I would uh, and I I would probably just I mean it's following up from Akila's question a bit, but that understanding of the Korean art market where um, when we say blue chip and master. Mm -hmm. from my memory and this might have changed one Ian and Sol and me but you know these are sort of government government sanctioned artists who are paid and supported and work in a fairly traditional way you know it is the mm -hmm. artisan skills which <clears throat> you know are kind of honed and you know to sort of perfection of the perception of what good Korean art is and those mm -hmm. are the sort of you know, seem to be the best when actually it's just a, a means, a viewpoint on those artists of the government, of certain people who think this is what this is what our culture needs to be represented by, not mm -hmm. a young artist, me, a new artist being a squid and, you know, pushing against the boundaries. You know, there's this very sort of rigid structure, isn't there, or has been, in terms of how do you become successful? And it is by doing a certain type of work. Would that be a correct sort of summary? <clears throat> well, yeah, it was before, but nowadays, uh, comparing to the, people know the, uh, about the global market, yeah. global art market. So. Um, when I meet some collectors or art dealers in Korea, they already knew some of famous artists than before. So such as David Hockney or yeah. Alex Katz yeah. or yeah, David Schringer or, well, yeah, <coughs> someone like that. Pardon. So comparing to the global art market, Korean art market is really, really, really small. It's mm. like 0.1% um, of whole for art market for global art market. So I'm trying to expand it. Yeah. And I'm trying to uh, promote our Korean good mm. artists to mm. the global market. Mm. There was just one other thing which I'd like to share with the group, which may or may not have changed. I mean, the last two years, we've all been sort of hidden away. So not really hearing what's going on. But I remember when um, when we first met Won He, um, mm -hmm. And um, the, the the company who kind of brought us together was one of yeah. the very yes well <laughs> was one of the very few artist led organisations. So I think mm. for you know some of our for our audience that there's no real sort of studio infrastructure. There's no sort of artist studios or collectives or. You know, I don't know if that has changed and shifted oh. slightly, but in comparison to maybe the UK or Europe, Korea, the Korea sort of it doesn't have that yet. Would that be a correct mm -hmm. assumption? Well, actually, there are some uh, changes of the residency program in, in Korea, which is supported by the Korean government. But uh, what I thought is that then what is the next? Yeah. What is the next after the program? What if the government stop to support the artist? Yeah. They need to find the collectors who are yeah, introducing to the art market. What if now? What if not? Then yeah, the new artist just stop their artist life mm. because of the financial problem, obviously. So that's why we are uh, trying to balance between the artist and the collectors with the art dealers. Thank you. Makala, do you have any last questions before we- Yeah, I just wanted to kind of pick up on, on, on that in terms of, um, in, in terms of, um, the, so there's the, the, the buying of, of work. Are there mm -hmm. any opportunities for artists who are working in that kind of, um, we've heard about Disney working against, protesting against oppression. We've heard about the squid. Are there any um, funded schemes that would put artists into communities to work on particular social justice issues? There, there is some, some but, but really, really few. few. So, so it cannot out. cover most of it. Is it yeah, growing so, or is it just remaining very small? Well, yeah, it was, it was growing before the COVID-19, 
yeah. because it is very public, right? Especially Dalton is thought work is it must be the public, right? But after COVID-19 situation, all stopped. So yeah, we are trying, well, for example, we are trying to uh, make money to the artist. So the way we support like uh, merchandising, yeah, producing, product, uh, produce merchandising using the artist artwork or something like that. So we're finding, we're trying to find the way to support artists in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we move on and hear um, from our wonderful friends who are based in Mombasa in Kenya, is anybody um, who is part of the audience have any burning questions now? Um, obviously we'll have some time at the end. Um, everybody is staying here for the duration, but um, anything coming through before we move on? Okay, so that's good. We'll, we'll hold on to them, I'm sure. It was, it was interesting, really. It always sort of fascinates me, the, the kind of, the, the differences, but also the similarities that we're all sort of um, uh, working under as well. So thank you. I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Caroline, um, to John, and to Pieta, who are represented as an artist from an organization who are based in Mombasa in Kenya um, uh, called Jaqua Arts. And we have been working with Jaqua Arts digitally only um, in the last sort of 18 months. Uh, we've been doing various interventions and opportunities um, online. We sincerely hope um, that we will be able to meet each other and work together in reality in 2022. <laughs> 23 <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if life will allow us um but uh you know so far it's been a real pleasure to meet the artists know the organization um and you know and find our footing with them um in terms of the work that they're doing and how we can kind of come together so i'd like to hand over to caroline to john and pieta um who are going to talk to you a little bit more about the work that's happening happening in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yes, once again, we are from Jukwa Arts. Um, I'm, I'm the producer and the founder of Jukwa Arts, which is a, I like to say we are a creative greenhouse and our main work is to use art to voice society issues. So um, our work is mainly for social impacts. And um, so this is what we've been doing for the last six or so years. Well, it's been a growing, um, growing organization and with the arts, generally arts in Kenya um, from time immemorial has been um, for, for education to as a vehicle for culture. And that's what we've been doing up to now. Um, well with urban and pop culture seeing its intersection with our social issues so uh with covid <laughs> they have been good and well it just threw us off and one of the things that it made us really realize is how um as an art industry in kenya um i think we were just left there naked we just realized how naked we are in terms of structures because that's it's a huge gap in our country. I think we were all we had all worked towards getting our audiences and just making it work, but now with COVID and the ban on gatherings and everything is when we realized. Oh wait a minute, does the government even realize that there are artists in this country? And even with the government efforts, it was we were all lumped up together as artists. So. It doesn't matter whether you're a performing artist, visual artist, we were all put in one basket. So we realized, oh, well, there's no really stru real structure that really that's there to buffer us as artists. So it's, it, it was it was a hard 2020 before we found our footing again. 
because for a long time how we operated was um from we don't have art councils in in our country for example we don't so we don't get funding from government to do arts but we get um funding from private entities and now with the with the economy just crashing on us due to covid of course private entities are not in a position to support art so that threw us a bit and then of course the other way we we make it work is of course through the the traveling and the festivals and all that which was now not happening but good thing is um it also opened to another world of possibilities a world of um the digitalization of all this of festivals of residencies and fellowships which has now been the tool we have been using to create visibility for artists um Ajuka arts i work with young upcoming artists i i don't quite work with very established artists because this is mainly a platform to grow and um just finding a footing in the art um so having um now it's opened a channel of okay now we can be part of fellowships and residencies and do collaborations without having to worry too much about will i really get my visa stamped <laughs> yeah because again it's a big issue um so in in a nutshell that's that has been the situation right now we are we are currently um a bit on recovery mode it's it's just been difficult because even with digitalization i think it has exposed and widened the gap between the haves and have nots we don't have full internet connectivity in this country for example so of course it really narrows our audience even in the urban we are in a city but even in this city not everyone has access to to internet and when they do um as artists right now we are competing with memes with all the free content online so i don't know whether people are willing to we've, we've tried doing some online work not everybody is willing to pay for a show or to buy art online so it's also a bit of a struggle up to now um but well we are we are trying to to hack it and one of the main things we've done is moving away now from the theater spaces as we know them conventionally to more non-theater spaces um and that's how we including the work we are currently doing which is some work on climate change we will be showcasing our work in more non-theater spaces i think at this point let me invite um i don't know with the time i don't want to speak <laughs> through and through so let me invite uh, maybe paita or john to just add in mm -hmm. their thoughts on the same and then we can continue paita hey hello hello okay um paita um a spoken word artist and <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here again <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, okay, my art is been working with you for almost like for I've been doing like performances, live performances, and I've been growing as a poet and now I can say I'm somewhere. <clears throat> mm, I, I'm an activist. I do activism with my art uh, like I've been doing something on violent extremism and other arts form. And <clears throat> during this COVID time, I think everything changed from, from just being an artist to just perform on live audience. We were forced to do something we should have never done before. Um, we were forced to do, we were forced to go to online. We, we have been looking for events, we've been looking for people so that we can just apply just hoping government can do something, but nothing happened like Carol said. So things have been, have been just like that, but we've been coping up and we have been we are getting used to the online online world now, like now we're having a meeting with someone from that far, maybe without COVID this will not be happening. You know? So things have been, have been difficult, but now I can say that things are just taking shape slowly and you're getting used to it. Maybe after after all this, 
maybe we can just adopt this our new way of art. We you know just get used to the live audiences and everything. We will be just also be doing online meetings like this and online performances and also more festivals internationally. And I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Thank you. John, did you want to add anything and so? Yeah, 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 uh, of course. Um, I think um, the 2020 period where COVID-19 was really at its peak, it was a good time for artists, uh, especially for me, it was a good time for me because that's the time where like, I, I stopped depending on people to call me uh, to come and perform, uh, but more avenues uh, arose out of that. Uh, there were uh, radio dramas, which I never did before. Uh, there were more, I had to be more present online, which I never used to be online, but uh, 2020 period, uh, I had to be online because there was no other way. So I had to really think about my online content and stuff. And uh, it was also an opportunity to try out different things. Uh, I really like had three, like in acting, in poetry, and uh, uh, yeah, acting, poetry, and uh, 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 rapping. Uh, I really, uh, 2020 uh, period and the co basically the COVID-19 period uh, where it was at peak was the opportunity for me as an artist to um, to to really work on, on on the things I had, and uh, and I think many other artists, basically in Mombasa, had the same opportunity. It was uh, a time to really reflect on what you had and how you can improve it to become better. And yeah, I think uh, as we proceed, that's the way we should do things and how things are. And as Yukwa Arts, Yukwa Arts has uh, been uh, at the forefront to, to dive in, in these different things. Because uh, like in Yukwa Arts, we've done almost everything. We have done uh, fine art, music, dancing, radio dramas. So yeah, it, it, it's, uh, of course it was bad, the lockdown and the shutdowns, but it was also uh, good in a, in a certain way, yeah. Thank you very much. Kyla, did you have any thoughts or questions? Um, first of all, thank you. That was really, really interesting. I, I, I mean, I've, I've just made a few notes about, um, I like the kind of idea about moving to non-theatre spaces. Um, I think we're seeing some of that in the UK as well as a kind of recognition that we need to think, rethink the way that we present art if we're actually going to affect change in who accesses it. Um, so that that's really interesting. Um, uh, and also the other experience that you've had, again, is something that uh, artists have fed back to, to me about it, you know, it was an awful time, but it was also a good time in terms of really pushing boundaries around digital uh, technology and kind of thinking in new ways about how to present work mm. um, but but I mean even even in the UK that issue of global of uh, digital poverty is really um, really tricky um, and again there are um, you know there are there are discussions if not investment going into how can one start to address that issue of how people can engage with um, digital work when they don't have access to, to any kind of computer or laptop or even a smartphone. So, um, you know, I think uh, that's, it's really interesting to hear um, from a, another country's perspective on that. Um, so thank you for that. I just, there's a couple of things that kind of, um, kind of drawing together I mean something we heard from from one he and Unsul and me and also from you guys as well um, or previously actually so I'm being a bit naughty but it's that kind of the value of the artist um, I remember when we spoke previously uh, one of your artists was talking about um, 
you know, how they were sort of discouraged from being, you know, an artist and it really wasn't something to follow. And, you know, this wasn't a career path and, you know, try and think of something else to do. Um, I'm not saying, you know, but there, there are sort of various degrees of that, I think, in this country, across Europe, you know, we all experience that kind of worry of, uh, you know, the standing and the value of the artist and, and, and that perception of, of the artist and the role of the artist and how that differs. I think there's, Michaela picked up on it as well, you know, the whole online thing. And I'm quite interested in, in your conversations about, you know, you were taking your work online, but also throwing that back to one he in terms of actually digital gallery platforms and how has that been received in, in South Korea? Are you, we've tried it here, it was okay, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm still, I feel we're, it's still a very, we're very naive around digital galleries for visual arts work, but also of course the presentation of other performance work digitally and how to really engage. Um, you know, you, you talked about the struggles in Mombasa and kind of that connection. How do you feel that's gone in Korea, Wonhe? Well, I think uh, most of our galleries now trying to digitalize their uh, own ex exhibition room. And also, well, I think in Korea, uh, they're not, honestly, uh, they're not focused on the performance or other digital artwork. Well, because we are, as I said, the real art market is getting expanded. So mm -hmm. people, people's interest it's more focused on the fine art, which is guaranteed. Yeah. So, uh, and during COVID, uh, during COVID-19 period, uh, all like most people now has been vaccinated now and then Korean art market has, um, it's like back to the normal trying to. Mm -hmm. So, well, but some of gallery, I know the NFT, it has been big issues in Korea also. Sorry, so you might need to say what NFT is. Oh, NFT is like um, a digital, digitalized artwork in, uh, in digital world. Like, uh, I don't know how to say it, but well, in Met Metaverse universe. Okay. Kind of. So yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah, well, would... yeah I, honestly, I'm not interested in it. So yeah. I I don't know not very well, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Was... So non yeah non fungible token. So it's realized like Bitcoin or something like that. But okay. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, well, I think this question is uh, more belong to me Park. So if you, yeah, okay. have experience of digitalize your artwork or your friend's work. Yeah, and just before me ask that, I think we have a question from Ben Carpenter. Ben, can you unmute? Yes. Mm. Thanks very much, Michelle. And really sorry, everyone, that I came late. I had some technical te technical issues this morning, which is ironic given the question that I'm about to ask, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is about <laughs> NFTs, because I've been um, uh, uh, talking to. Um, colleagues in the UK recently, uh, some of whom are working in industry, setting up blockchain technologies and developing it for, for creatives. And the kind of faith that these people have in what their product's going to offer uh, creatives is extraordinary. And this is kind of related to digital poverty, isn't it? Because it used to be the case of digital poverty related to whether you had a computer or not. And now I feel that it's about whether you've been exposed to this whole new language, an entirely new technological paradigm, which is developing so quickly and what sorts of um, skills you felt young people needed to be exposed to when they're, when they're at university. Because, you know, I've been, I've been following how this um, has been, um, how it's kind of broken over the last couple of years, and, you know, in the art press and some extraordinary and eye-watering sums of money that are being spent on, on, on NFT auctions and, and so forth. But these are very exclusive circles and there isn't a very easy entry into that market. Um, it requires a lot of technical expertise and so far as I can understand it as well, quite a lot of money in some cases to, to mint tokens. And I wanted to ask, uh, as you brought it up, um, 
uh, um, Wan Nam, I wanted to ask you what you thought, uh, whether um, this, were the skills that people, the emerging artists needed was the first part of the question. I've got a, a follow-up for you as well, but I'd like to hear a little bit about the, the kind of help that you think people need. Yeah, so, well, NFT, that's really, really difficult uh, topic for me because I only invest what I understand. But for me, NFT, <laughs> not really. It's not, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not charming enough for me because I know the market is getting um, exclusive, expanded day by day. But <sighs> not sure about it yet. But yeah. yeah. I'm willing to. I will, I will. I will dig you out of that hole on here, and I will ask me to uh, <laughs> to maybe talk about it from a perspective as an artist. You know, is this something yeah. that you? I know you were about to answer, and I I um, popped Ben into the question. But what's your kind of thoughts about it? Um, um. Wait, should I speak on the NFT part or moving yeah, online with on my that, work? On that wider question, and yeah, you know, it's something. Are you affected by it? Is that something mm -hmm. you feel? You know that you know that you, it, are you are you is it passing you by? Is it something that's coming up? You know how how does it kind of sit with you as a Korean artist working today? Well, digitizing my work has been a struggle since like March 2020. Um, and because I work with live audiences, it's been extremely hard to basically perform on a Zoom seminar or um, in my room and just recording myself. Um, so I've like, I guess I was one of those lady or lazy artists who didn't figure out how to deal with it and sort of moved on to become a more of a facilitator. And I know a lot of friends who are in I guess who are doing non-tangible art um, who struggles to basically exhibit in a digital I guess platform um, so I've made podcast shows um, live streams that sort of delve into who they are as an artist and their struggles within this new environment rather than to I guess force people in and basically make them mm. I do what they didn't want to do but seeing how this situation is dragging on for more than a year I feel like it's just something that people have to get used to and for me and any other artists to just face and I guess develop their skills and and for M NFT it's like honestly I do not talk about it with any of my friends it's just something as you said it's such an exclusive circle I read it on art review how Christie's sold what 1.5 billion pounds only. billion yeah <laughs> million yeah, sorry million pounds um 69.3 uh, million dollars for people's wow. work precisely <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's extraordinary so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah right it, yeah it's crazy so sorry, yes michaela just before we go and have a little small comfort break and then we'll come back and hear from you and yeah. Marco and uh Olya. I just wanted to bring it back to Caroline because when she started, she talked about um, how residencies, fellowships and collaborations um, are, are, are being used to platform their work, um, which seemed a very practical and pragmatic way of, of making sure that, that they remain visible. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of presuming, are those digital or are those real? Um, yes. Targets? Okay, yeah, yeah. Though, like through 2020 and well, up to now, we've most of our artists um, have been part of um, virtual fellowships, virtual yeah. residencies. Yeah, and, and at least that has given us visibility and collaborations. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the space has also quite opened up a bit. So it's possible for me to be in a fellowship anyway. In this in this globe yeah but we are, even as jukwa arts um at least that's one of the things we've been able to do even with the gap because we still have a ban uh, we still have we still have a curfew we still have a ban on gatherings we still have all yeah. those bans so at least the the residency like we've been in a residency the one i was talking about where we are doing some work on climate change 
yeah. it's been um a residency but not a live-in residency i don't know how to say that yeah it's not a live-in residency so the, the the artists commute for the sessions and go back at least that has kept us we are, we are able to still continue with our, our work without issues with the government and then now we are showcasing this to non-theater spaces where at least because we'll showcase it in a festival in like about two weeks in, actually in a week's time um in non-theater spaces where like there's no ban on like for where people gather without us making them gather for example at the beach we yeah. are doing some work at the beach the government does not have an issue with us doing work at the beach because we've not people would have gathered there even without our show yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's it's just it's both the virtual mm -hmm. with the rest of the world and then physically here with just our artists mm -hmm. I think that that whole idea around the virtual fellowships and residencies might be something that we come back to because it seems to me that that's perhaps still underutilized as a mechanism for making those kind of connections and environmentally of course mm. it's um it's it can be arguably more friendly so um yeah we'll we'll park that to one side and have our break and then come back okay Wonderful. Well, thank you. It was two really interesting viewpoints. Um, and um, we will have a third uh, from Yerne, from Marco, and from Oliera with a sort of European perspective. Um, but we'll just have a, just a couple of minutes, just everybody needs to get a drink, have a comfort break, and then we'll pop back. Have a spotlight on you. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> oh. Um, and to start the sort of third part of our conversation, um, and I'd like to welcome uh, Yerne, Olia, and Marco. Uh, Yerne is the uh, project coordinator for SUK, which is um, a Slovenian based arts organization. Olia is an artist based in um, Slovenia, and Marco is a representative of BJCEM, which is an international network. Uh, sorry, my apologies, a European um, network. Um, of organisations of which uh, UK new artists and SUK are members. Um, and we, it'll be interesting to kind of talk about that kind of relationship and the importance of that membership and the coming together. But if I hand over to you, who would like to um, maybe start the conversation? Shall I put, shall I ask Yerne to start? I can, thank you. Uh... So uh, just a short introduction. Uh, um, uh, I'm uh, Yerne um, in, in, from Students Cultural Center for Longer uh, or Scouts. Uh, our organization is uh, celebrating 50th, 50th anniversary of its work next year uh, and uh, traces its roots back to the student, uh, student movement in the 60s and 70s. Uh, since then, it has grown um, exponentially, and uh, we work on different uh, artistic disciplines, from visual arts to music to theater, uh, publishing, uh, and uh, also, very importantly, we include civil movements in uh, our work. Um, uh, and um, we were the starting point of the LGBT movement in Eastern Europe uh, in the 80s. Um, now, our main goal is to open space for uh, young artists, to include them in cultural sphere, to, um, so that they can get, they can get uh, presented, uh, they can connect them, themselves with older, uh, older colleagues and so on. Um, and um, yes, uh, generally we're a very community-based organization. Um, now, the situation in Slovenia is uh, quite, um, well, um, it's uh, a peculiar time for uh, us here in uh, Slovenia. Uh, the COVID, uh, the COVID um, epidemics uh, uh, with the closing of, um, of uh, Every, of, uh, of, of venues, of, um, of galleries and so on. Uh, there was a huge, uh, there was a huge uh, problem for artists to present and to work. 
So uh, one of the main challenges of artists and cultural operators as well is uh, now facing lack of income and uh, rising poverty. Um, in, uh, in the last years, there have been studies done um, and uh, in the cultural creative sector during the, during the COVID epidemic, uh, some 56% uh, percent of uh, people who responded to the study uh, were thinking of leaving the sector, which is quite, uh, quite troublesome. Uh, of course, um, they report uh, anxiety, they report fear of the future, uh, and so on. Um, now things are opening, so uh, hopefully things will get uh, a bit better, but uh, the future is still cruelly um, uncertain how, uh, how this will evolve. Um, also, uh, what we face uh, in Slovenia in the artistic scene that faces is um, the gentrification of our cities. Um, and uh, so in our cities, uh, there has been this huge uh, gentrification, uh, a lot of uh, independent spaces, a lot of independent artistic spaces uh, have, been, uh, have been closed, uh, have been demolished, uh, have been uh, 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 designated to become um, well, fabulous new uh, office spaces and uh, marketplaces and so on. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's quite a challenge. Uh, it's quite a challenge for the independent uh, culture. And uh, on the other side, we see a, a strengthening of the institutional sector um, with uh, opening of, uh, let's say, new galleries, uh, new institutions, which are quite institutional, institutional and very heavily curated. So now, uh, now our artists uh, uh, are in a paradoxical um, state because uh, on one hand, uh, we have these new spaces uh, where they can present art, but on the other hand, they do not have spaces to create art, um, which, um, or, or to present art in a non-curated, uh, non-institutional way. Uh, there are still some places, but this uh, this uh, space is getting uh, quite uh, smaller. Um, of course, uh, during the pandemic, also there has been uh, a new um, the political situation has ev evolved into uh, in a disturbing way. Um, the, we have seen the rise of uh, new conservatism uh, in the society and also uh, in the government, uh, uh, and um, which um, there are some examples like uh, artists and uh, cultural operators have been deemed as uh, parasites of the society. Uh, um, the government tried to uh, cancel the leases of uh, of a building where 25 uh, uh, independent cultural organizations and uh, uh, research institutes and civil rights organizations uh, have their home in the center of Ljubljana, and that just happened in the in the middle of the epidemic. So uh, there are uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, that we face. Uh, um, in these times, uh, but um, but the independent scene uh, and the artistic scene is uh, quite vibrant. Uh, it's uh, very well connected uh, internationally, and uh, uh, it has been one of the main uh, um, uh, engines of also democratic reforms and uh, pluralizing uh, uh, our. Uh, our society, so I still believe that we are quite strong and we will, uh, of course, overcome these challenges uh, in the coming times. Oh. Um, also, Schutz Association is uh, a proud member of uh, BGCM um, and uh, this uh, uh, Biennial for Young Artists has been uh, very instrumental for, uh, for us to present our art artists uh, abroad and to connect them uh, um, Olia was also uh, 
presented in the Biennale in uh, Tirana, I think. Uh, but um, I think that's enough uh, from me for now. And I would like to give a um, uh, word to Olia or Marco. Mm. Well, should we go over to Olia, as you mentioned that your participation in the BJCM uh, Biennial in Tirana in Albania. Um, was that the, maybe the first opportunity that you'd shown internationally or? Um, I actually don't remember if, it's, it, if it was the first opportunity to show internationally, also because I was exhibiting in Croatia and because I'm from Croatia, I was born there, but I live in Slovenia. Okay. So I somehow have uh, both states, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a view on both states. And uh, as Jernej said, uh, at the beginning of uh, epidemics, we had also a change of government, which mm -hmm. went uh, ultra right. And uh, in my work, this is visible because I uh, work in performance and in visual arts and mostly, most of the times I use uh, naked body, mm -hmm. which is actually human. Mm -hmm. And this is now a big problem for the government and for people because government is now pushing people uh, to, uh, to openly uh, uh, discriminate and openly, uh, to be openly fascist. Uh, so I will give you an example. Uh, in April, we had uh, I had a performance uh, which was name was Breed, and we were in an art gallery, in a window of art gallery, standing naked with the organic bags on our faces, uh, and we were breathing. And we were uh, some woman reported us to the police, and then we had to go on court. Uh, we all. Each of us had to pay uh, 208 euros for this. Uh, then we uh, asked uh, in Slovenia now, the, because of all the uh, tickets that uh, um, people got from police and from, I don't know, eating a croissant without a mask and uh, stuff like this, uh, the network uh, of uh, lawyers for uh, to defend democracy uh, formed. And we asked them to uh, also uh, to take our case to the court. And uh, today, just today, they uh, sent me an email that we got it. So we uh, will not be, we, we don't have to pay for these uh, um, tickets. Yeah. And like censorship is uh, in, uh, in uh, has its wings now in yeah. Slovenia. But also in other parts of Europe, uh, I was my work was also censored in Italy, uh, where I was invited with uh, also one performance, Naked Life, and we are naked in the, this performance, and it's about feminism and about uh, uh, existing. Uh, and actually, Italian eco feminists uh, censored my work because uh, they thought it's a pornography, which is like I. <laughs> I don't know, which is why also during the COVID pandemic, uh, I thought that maybe it would be best if I find some other job or um, to go in some other field uh, where I can just normally live my life and uh, not to care about this, uh, not to fight with the government and with the people just to normally live and earn money. Uh, but now, yeah, everything is uh, a bit changing. Like, uh, we hope that uh, soon also this right government will, will fall and we will have uh, the opportunity to uh, work normally again. Uh, but as Yerna said before, like big uh, uh, gallery spaces are opening. And these gallery spaces, they are not meant for uh, young artists. They are not meant for uh, local people. They are meant for tourism or, I don't know, uh, well-known artists. And uh, we are losing our spaces. Uh, also, we got uh, help from government. But this help, uh, it's more uh, like... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's not so good because uh, now we have to uh, take care how much we will earn. And if we earn uh, more than uh, like few, few euros more, then we have to return the help. 
and it's it's not the best situation in Slovenia for artists and for uh, art organizations, but uh, we hope that soon this uh, will end and it will open again. Mm. Thank you. That was very illuminating, I have to say. And I've been watching, obviously, the situation that's been happening over there with, you know, trepidation, really. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Marco. And I just want to say that actually, just when you're talking about that kind of unification, that you know, the differences, that actually BJ, BJCEM was kind of created as a unification um, uh, network be, um, which came out of the conflict at Sarajevo um, and one of the first biennials um, was in Sarajevo to try and um, heal those rifts through arts, through young artists to try and set a different course that would avoid um, the um, Bosnian and, and um, and uh, well, the Bosnian War. Um, so I don't know, obviously, Marco, you can pick up a bit more about that, but actually the sort of roots of BJCM come in that kind of unification, don't they? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and hello, everybody again. Uh, let me just uh, thank you uh, again. Uh, thank you, uh, UK New Artists, for uh, inviting us. Uh, first of all, I'm here. Um, my name is Marco Alfieri, and I'm uh, the communication officer uh, here at the association, and I'm talking also on behalf of Federica Candelaresi, who is the executive director and wasn't able, unfortunately, to be here to, today. So, um, as you as you said, uh, yes, BGCM, I, I would like just to briefly uh, tell something about the, the history uh, that is linked to what you were saying, and then maybe talk a little bit about the last edition of the biennial that mm. can be considered also a kind of good practice or <laughs> so and so practice uh, okay. due to the in the framework of the COVID uh, yes, situation. Absolutely. So, BGCM uh, is is a is a network uh, made of forty seven uh, members, including uh, UK new artists and and Skook. Uh, and uh, we have uh, among our members both public institutions like local, regional, and also national um, bodies, but also uh, independent. Uh, associations and, organ and cultural organization um, coming from 16 countries, uh, both from uh, Europe and the, the Mediterranean area. Uh, we are legally uh, uh, based in, in uh, Brussels, in, in Belgium, but the executive office, so the place where we manage all the activities is uh, in Turin, Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, BGCM was, was born, as you, as you said, to foster mutual understanding, intercultural di dialogue and collaboration uh, among young artists in the Euro-Mediterranean area. Uh, so we develop uh, projects and activities providing uh, trainings, mobility, uh, mobilities and exchange opportunities uh, to support uh, young artists uh, and, and their creative process um, and their careers. Uh, we, uh, our main, the main activity that we organize is the biennial of, of young artists. Uh, we organized a uh, 19 edition um, and uh, uh, it was conceived as a multidisciplinary uh, event for young artists under the age of 35 uh, from, again, both Europe and the Mediterranean area. So in the 19 edition, editions, we uh, involved over 10,000 artists young artists and uh, uh, coming from uh, different disciplines from visual arts to applied arts uh, to moving images, literature, performing arts, music and, and so on. Um, in, the late, in the last years, even before uh, the COVID uh, crisis, um, some changes were made uh, in the organization to make the event uh, more sustainable. Uh, so we changed the format of the biennial and we reduced the, the number of artists uh, involved. Um, it has continued to be an event where artists were able to showcase their, their art and their works, but also it, it developed uh, um, opportunities for research, training, networking, and setting up of collaborational projects. Uh, so not only a showcase uh, of, of, uh, or an exhibition, but something more. Um, during each Biennale, there is, during the opening days of, of each Biennale, we try to gather all the artists 
uh, that are selected to participate to the Biennale that are usually selected through an open call uh, and chosen by uh, a curator or a team or a curatorial team. So the artists are able to come to the, to the, to the city that is hosting the, the Biennial. And uh, uh, unfortunately, of course, due to the COVID-19, that uh, was not uh, uh, entirely possible for the last edition of the Biennial that is uh, currently undergoing in the Republic of San Marino. Uh, so uh, um, we decided, um, I mean, the, the, the last edition of the Biennial in San Marino was um, supposed to, to happen in 2020. So in, in the, the worst year <laughs> possible. Uh, and it, uh, uh, was uh, 70 artists were selected through the through an open call coming from 21 countries. So uh, their their, particip their participation was of course compromised because it was not possible to to move in 2020. Uh, however, uh, BJCM uh, as well as the local host, which are the the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of San Marino and the cultural institutions of the Republic of San Marino and the university, uh, as well as the curatorial board decided not to cancel uh, the event uh, and to continue to research and be in dialogue with the, the 70 artists that were already selected, um, creating a kind of digital waiting room uh, that was the, the website mediterraneabiennial.org that was considered as, as a collective transitory space, uh, um, as I said, as a sort of waiting room where uh, artists were able to start um, communicating and cooperating together with the, also the curatorial uh, board. Uh, and that was, was, was useful to kind of gradually build the ecosystem of, of, the, of the biennial. Uh, then with the, with the normalization of the situation, uh, the event was postponed to 2021. So the, the, luckily it was possible not to cancel the event, but just to postpone it to the, to the next year. Um, and that was also a kind of a political choice uh, based on the fact that it was necessary to uh, keep on uh, supporting uh, the, the artist and to make the event possible. And it, of course, it was a different event from what it was uh, thought at the beginning. So we had basically three appointments, one in May, uh, that was more an institutional event. It was not possible in May to uh, make artists come to, to Italy, to, to San Marino. Uh, of course, uh, it, it, there were uh, still uh, travel bans and limitations. So it was more an institutional event, but we created alongside with that um, a digital program called Digital Swamp. Uh, and it included talks, performances, and, and screenings all available on the YouTube channel of the, of the biennial. Uh, so over 25 artists and guests and, in, and institu international institutions from more than 10 countries uh, were involved hosting live streams uh, from Lebanon to Slovenia, from Greece to UK. So um, we had a good response also from the audience uh, and uh, uh, the online programming was really possible thanks to the commitment of the members of BJCM. Uh, and, and it was uh, a really successful uh, program. Then in July, uh, in San Marino, we were able to uh, organize a more physical uh, event with the participation of more artists, not all uh, artists, unfortunately, and not all members of the GSM were able to participate, but a good uh, representation of, of artists was, was, uh, was able to come to San Marino uh, and to, uh, participated to a performative program that includes performance lectures, live actions, conversations, listening sessions, and, and so on. With, of course, a live uh, audience uh, in, in compliance of all the uh, safety uh, measures. So um, all said to, to, to say that uh, BGCM as an international network tried to uh, put in place some um, uh, actions to uh, be resilient and to uh, try to capi capitalize uh, also the opportunities that the, the digitalization offer. Uh, even if we know, uh, and I, I would like to, to, uh, to, to link some of, of the things that were said before, uh, we are also aware that this is digitalization is not something that is uh, uh, fully accessible for, for everyone. 
and uh, it's not easy to involve it, to engage also an audience through the, the digital uh, means. So there is a lot of, lo of work to do uh, with, uh, with, with these uh, aspects, also from the communication uh, point of view. Uh, but we, we try to, to, to did our best to, uh, to, to support the, the young artists and to mm. uh, make possible for them to, to participate in, in, this, uh, in this event, which is uh, still going on. The, the exhibitions closed, uh, on, uh, are closing on October uh, the 3rd or 31st. Um, so uh, there are still uh, ex guided exhibitions that are uh, going on in San Marino, of course, booking... Uh, uh, is mandatory, and there are all the uh, social distancing measures in the in the exhibition spaces. But still, the event uh, is 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 going on uh, mm. until the end oh, thank of, you. of October. I know that everybody who involved with San Marino, you know, throughout has done an amazing job in you know turning something that was meant to be very real and very tangible into something, you yeah. know, you know, navigating these these very 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 difficult waters. Um, Thank you to everybody who spoke and I'm going to ask everybody to kind of come back into the room so we're all together um, and all can be seen um, and um, see if there are any questions um, that would like to be shared. I have one for Olia, but I will want to hear from some of the UK artists maybe about what you've heard today. Um, if you have any questions, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, while you're having a peruse and think on that. Ol um, sorry, Olia, <laughs> I'm sure yeah. I said that wrong again. I don't know why I can't keep that in my mind. Um, how did you feel about participating as an artist in the Albanian version? I mean, that was the last sort of real one, I suppose. You know, the impact of being with a huge group of artists from around Europe, learning, seeing, socializing, showing. Mm. Did that have an impact on your work as an artist? Um, well, for I was uh, together with uh, two colleagues, with uh, Jiva Petric. She was uh, also part of this project, um, Digital uh, Red Web. And uh, we enjoyed it because it was first time uh, to show this uh, performance uh, internationally. Uh, we, it was interesting to see how um, the audience uh, reacts on uh, this because the audience is different in uh, different countries and uh, we really liked it. Um, it was a good experience, but uh, uh, we were too focused on our project and uh, to, uh, uh, to make it uh, technically everything all right and to find uh, the things that were missing, uh, like some small technical details and uh, so we couldn't uh, uh, spend more time with uh, other artists, which we miss, mm. that uh, we could, uh, I don't know, have organized uh, some uh, group meetings or to uh, be like more uh, together. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No, I mean, we, we were also out in Albania as well. And, you know, and I think it's, it's a very good example of when, for many artists, this would be the first time that they would work internationally or have their work shown internationally. Um, and it was a very good example of sort of managing expectations technically, um, you know, when you're traveling as an artist and presenting work overseas, you know, you're not, you know, your, your expectations have to be you know, refocus culturally to what that um, what that country can offer you and has and can do, and to kind of prepare for that from very simple things like having the right plugs that you can put, you know, um, and adapters that you can show your work on or have, or, you know, asking for equipment ahead of time because that country may not have such things. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the expectations are different and the ecologies are different and the finances are different. And, you know, places may not even have data projectors, you know, and therefore you suddenly made this assumption that you'll be able to show your work and that country can't support it. I know there's lots of nodding from Yerne there about 
<laughs> you know, um, some things like that. I mean, I know myself and Laura, when we were going to Albania, I'm sorry, picking on Albania was absolutely fantastic Biennale. We got so much out of it, but it presented challenges. You know, one of our artists, um, uh, Anne Tamlin, who did a, a sort of um, a, a balloon that was, uh, if you texted it, it would increase in size, but obviously it was dismantled and in parts and sent through customs, who then thought it was a bomb, um, you know, because of the, com you know, the consummate parts. So then that got held up in customs and, you know, the kind of craziness of all of that, that you kind of, you can't, sometimes you can't think about or anticipate what's going to happen the sort of joys and ups and downs of working internationally or the lovely Connor you know with a kind of six inch nail in a concrete wall trying to put up a piece of work you know <laughs> because there were no technicians there was no support staff you know and that's not because there weren't any it's just that's what culturally is available and I think it's changing one's perceptions to be able to deal with that and have the patience and openness to ride out through problems. I don't know what some of the other artists feel about that and the experiences they may have had, um, the ups and downs and the joys, um, you know. Is there's, a, there's something around um, I, I'm BJCM and, um, and uh, Action Europe used to talk about the development of intercultural competencies yeah. um, and that that's something that we need to be able to um, train uh, artists in understanding um, exactly yeah. those differences and it's not something traditionally that uh, certainly in UK uh, institute universities that was really part of the curriculum um, and I know that that was something that was certainly being discussed about how we can really develop that um, so that there's a greater understanding that we can make these collaborative projects online or in person and really understand um, the, the, the kind of cultural, the cultural differences and similarities. Yeah. I mean, I know when, you know, when um, uh, one here came over with a group of Korean artists to Nottingham, you know, the, the challenges were real. Uh, <laughs> and it just exist, you know, if you're... Right work they are there the time limits the, you know you're tired mm -hmm. you know you might have a jet lag you know and then you've still got you know there's mm -hmm. sort of all these things which come into play but ultimately I feel the value of being together sharing work <laughs> learning from each other is unquestionable and I know one of the one of the things we wanted to talk about was you know what are your expectations of the future about working internationally um, and is that still something that's important to you all? Certainly what from what we've heard and, and all of the speakers there's been such a rich um, seam of, of good ideas and new approaches that I think there's um, I've learned a lot um, and I'm sure that other people will have, you know, jotted down things that, that they want to kind of think about for their own particular country or their own network. Um, it, it feels to me that um, we have the opportunity with the Zoom culture to kind of make these <laughs> perhaps more regularly available for us to have those sharings in a way that before we used to physically have to travel to another country to take part in big events and although I really hope we do get back to that. I still, I just wonder if, if these becoming more of a regular beat help us to, to develop and then also support those, you know, I, I, my heart is bleeding. I mean, Ljubljana, I remember, you know, 15, 20 mm. years ago, meeting the Minister of Culture, who was at that stage spending 4.5% of the bud GDP on, on culture. Um, you know, where did we go? How did we get from there to, to where you are now is just, so heartbreaking you know I, I i just remember being so jealous of what was going on in slovenia and it seems so far in advance of any other european country so um together hopefully we can we can support you through this dark period um and give you opportunities to to show work that that challenges and has naked bodies in it i mean if you can't do it there then you know certainly can still do it in the uk for the moment mm -hmm. um but you know i I just think that, that this kind of a network is just critical, really. 
thank you. That was um, a nice point to kind of end on. I will do one last call out for any questions. Otherwise, I will um, uh, thank everybody from the bottom of my heart for being here. We all have to respect that time differences. You know, one here. What time is it with you at the moment? Uh, it's seven or eight. PM yeah. here. Yeah. So, so, you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's much appreciated to everybody. Oh, sorry, Hugh has a question. Sorry, Hugh, go on. Yeah, no, I, I do have a question, but like Michelle said, you know, if it, if it becomes impossible to answer it within that time frame, then that's fine. I just, I wanted to pick up on something that, that me Park said about how your experience of being based in the UK, both at BA and MA level, made you reflect a little bit on your own, what made you kind of maybe an outsider within that space or maybe your own personal nationality, your own personal experience, being an international person in that place. So I wanted to ask uh, to the artists within the, the, the chat here, um, to what extent, that they consider there to be a risk of this sort of borderless attitude of sharing work through the online means because it's very seductive to be told you know you could work internationally but really uh, to what extent does this reduce your practice to something which is impersonal or not rooted in uh, ident personal identity or, or place um, so yeah, I wanted to ask about what 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 the artists see as the positives, but also the risks in working internationally in that sort of digital way. Yeah. When me, Pieta, Olia, John. I I just like to mention now, speaking as an artist, um, last year I was part of a fellowship um for six months virtually with about 40 artists it was anchored in the u.s and i think um answering you what i felt is like we only gave what we felt was safe so there's this safety in the in this digital space um i don't think i'm not sure whether to say that safety is good because then i don't give I don't show you all that you need to to experience from me as an artist. I only deliver what's safe, given um, we don't get like, for example, in that setting, we were 40 artists, different countries, different cultures. Um, but I only expose what I feel you might want to feel to to experience. But if we are physically together, I think I'm able to just give it all whether consciously or subconsciously but i think here i'm very precautious so i'm very cautious of what i give as an artist i'm mm. I'm, I'm covered by the the digital space yeah that's that's my experience it's a great answer thank you caroline mm. me alia pieta john is there anything you would like to add to that no, no. me no <laughs> All righty. Yeah. That was a great question. Thank you, Hugh. And I think a really interesting answer from Carolyn, which I'm sure all the artists would kind of share as well. I want to, I'll draw this meeting to a close now, um, as we have no other questions. I think it's been highly interesting to sort of open the doors from Europe, from um, East Asia, from, from Kenya, um, and just sort of have a peek inside what, what we all share, what makes us different, but also the real commonalities and struggles 